Transmission line examples. We'll put a pause button on introducing new material for transmission lines in this video and just work through some examples. One is the RG59 coaxial cable. This is the cable that you would use to plug into the back of your television before everything became digital. So that'll be one example. And then also a microstrip design example and provide you some equations for calculating the characteristic impedance of microstrips and how to design them. The RG59 coax. So if you've been following this entire lecture series back in a previous course, when we did electrostatics and magnetostatics, we analyzed a coaxial cable and actually calculated its distributed capacitance and distributed inductance. And we did a rather rigorous electromagnetic analysis to come up with those. We assumed it was lossless. So our attenuation coefficient is zero. Our phase constant is omega times square root of mu epsilon. Then we can derive an expression for the characteristic impedance. That's the square root of L divided by C. And we make some more simplifications and we end up getting a rather simple equation to calculate the characteristic impedance as long as the radius of the inner conductor is much, much less than the radius of the outer conductor. So we arrived there. Now for an RG59 coax, here are the typical parameters. Now, to get those parameters, we need to do an electromagnetic analysis. This is actually something we're going to talk about later, but not now. So these numbers mysteriously appear, and we have them. Given those fundamental parameters, let's calculate the complex propagation constant, attenuation coefficient, phase constant, characteristic impedance. And once we have those, now we can classify the line. Is it lossless? Is it weakly absorbing? Is it distortionless? So let's go ahead and dive into that. So we're given the fundamental parameters. We'd like to determine everything else. And this will be at 2 gigahertz. So first, all of our equations involve omega, the angular frequency, instead of the ordinary frequency. The ordinary frequency is the thing that's in units of hertz, kilohertz, gigahertz. But our equations have omega. So we calculate omega from our ordinary frequency of 2 gigahertz. And we get about 12.5 times 10 to the 9 radians per second. So that will simplify our following calculations. The characteristic impedance, we had this general equation given R, L, G, and C, and now we have omega. So we just plug in all of our numbers here, and out comes a characteristic impedance of 78.9 ohms plus a small imaginary part. So the line is specified to be at 75 ohms, and that's pretty close. If we look at the imaginary part, 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4, I would say that that's pretty small. So already I am suspicious that we have a weakly absorbing line. We can't say that it's lossless. It'll be close. Uh, so I would say weakly absorbing, but we'll look at that more rigorously later. Certainly the loss is low. The next thing is our complex propagation constant. And we plug in our values for our LGC and omega. And out comes 6.2 times 10 to the minus 4 plus a J 68 inverse meters. And then from there, we can read our attenuation coefficient and our phase constant immediately off of gamma. So let's go ahead and just read those off. And our attenuation coefficient, 6.2 times 10 to the 4, nepers per meter. A lot of times this is just given in inverse, inverse meters, and that's what I normally do. But I put it here just to show you that sometimes they'll say nepers per meter. And nepers is kind of like radians. It's not really a unit. And then we have our phase constant, 68 radians per second. Well, there's radians, which isn't really a unit, but it kind of helps us keep track of what it actually means. So really, we got alpha and beta automatically. That fell out of the complex propagation constant. And this attenuation coefficient is quite small. So we asked the question, is the line lossless? It can't be lossless because R and G are not zero. 
And we also found that the attenuation coefficient is not zero. Next question, is the line weakly absorbing? Well, yes. So we had two conditions. If one R has to be less than omega L. So we can plug in our numbers and we can see that R is much less than omega L. We also had G being much less than omega C. And it turns out, yeah, G is much less than omega C. So we do conclude this is a weakly absorbing line. Is it a distortionless line? Answer's no, but it turns out it's quite close. So we'll write our condition this way. We fill in our numbers and we get a 2.5 times 10 to the minus 12, which is actually less than 4.3 10 to the minus 12. It would have to be equal to say that it's distortionless, but I would say it's pretty close. Now let's look at a microstrip and talk about how to design this and analyze it. So for a lossless microstrip, here's a set of equations that you can use to calculate the effective parameters of this, given the geometry. So we define our microstrip by the width of our signal trace, the height of the dielectric, and the dielectric constant. Now, since we're assuming this is lossless, our attenuation coefficient will be zero. We have a way now of estimating our phase constant for this. It's the free space wave number, that's 2 pi over the free space wavelength, times the square root of this effective dielectric constant. So the effective dielectric constant is definitely not the dielectric constant because we can see this equation modifies that. The way we interpret the effective dielectric constant, imagine we had a wave in this infinitely homogeneous medium, dielectric medium. What dielectric constant would that medium have to be given so that the wave marches at the same speed as the wave in this line? And so it turns out that's the effective dielectric constant. And so from that, we get our phase constant. Now, what about the characteristic impedance? Well, here's a bit more complicated formula, and that's how we calculate the characteristic impedance. And there's two cases. If the uh, width of our line is rather thin relative to the height, we can use this equation for characteristic impedance. If the width of the line is wider relative to the height of the dielectric, we use a different equation. So here's the problem uh, that we want to solve. So typically in the manufacturing, you'll, you'll choose your material. You want to make your printed circuit boards out of FR4 or something like that. So most often the dielectric constant is fixed and we don't really have a choice there. So to control the impedance of the line, what we have to control is this W over H ratio. So let's design a 50 ohm microstrip line in FR4. That's a standard printed circuit board material. It has a dielectric constant of around 4.5 at 2.4 gigahertz. So given that, what is this ratio W over H such that we would get a 50 ohm microstrip line? The first thing we need to do is take that equation we had for calculating the characteristic impedance and turn it around and solve for W over H. And so here's how we can do that. We can calculate these intermediate parameters A and B, which have no physical meaning. They just make these equations easier to calculate. And so if we have thin lines, we use this equation to calculate W over H. That would give us the characteristic impedance we want. And by the way, the characteristic impedance we want appears right here in our calculations for A and B. And so for a wide line, we have this other more complicated equation. Let's put numbers into this. So given that we have a dielectric constant of 4.5, it's at 2.4 gigahertz, uh, and we want a characteristic impedance of 50 ohms, we calculate for A and B. For A, we get 1.5. For B, we get 5.6. We then take these values for A and B, and we can calculate these two different things for thin lines and for wide lines. That's W over H. 
and we see that they're almost the same value in this case. So we're probably very close to W equal H. And so we just come away and say, let's let W over H equal 1.88. So as long as our microstrip has that ratio enforced, we will get a 50 ohm transmission line. Another thing that happens very often is that we tend not to control the thickness of the substrate. That's usually dictated to us in the manufacturing. So if we're making a printed circuit board, it's just standard to have layers a certain thickness. And so what this comes down to is most often when we're designing transmission lines, we control its impedance through the thickness of the line. The thickness of the substrate and the dielectric constant are often fixed for us, and we don't have control over that. So let's say your manufacturing person says, yeah, but the, the thickness is going to be 0.5 millimeters, and to deviate from that would cost a lot of money and yada yada. So that's okay. We will just adjust the width W to give us that 50 ohms. So the W will simply be 1.88 times H, where H is 0.5 millimeters, and we figure out that the width of the line is about 0.94 millimeters. So if the width of our microstrip line is 0.9 millimeters, we will get a 50 ohm microstrip. And this is very representative of how designs actually work when people are designing circuits. What about the phase constant? Well, first we calculate the effective permittivity. We then also need our free space wave number, which we'll calculate from the frequency and the speed of light. That ends up being about 50 inverse meters. Then we can calculate our phase constant, and that comes out to be about uh, 92.6 inverse meters. And the reason we want these parameters, in a little bit, we're going to learn how to design things from transmission lines, and we will need those parameters to do those designs with.